Okay, so uh, this talks about um, the blood tests for determining iron status. So my declarations are that I work in a lab, That's, this is my area of expertise, I've been there for quite a while. Um, we perform about 2,000 iron tests every day at Melbourne Pathology. Uh, nationally I have a role uh, to do with the quality of analyses as well as in the Medicare review, what gets paid for. And internationally, I have roles on deciding what the cutoff should be for interpreting uh, many of these tests. I'm coming with that background. Now, I'm not sure about uh, red jumpers and everything, but certainly blood and mines that look red are full of iron. And, uh, and that's why they're red. Um, and it plays a role in many parts of the body. I'm not going into much detail on this, but especially in haemoglobin, which is red. Um, it contains four atoms of iron and that helps you carry oxygen. In myoglobin, which is what makes muscle red, and that's what um, helps oxygen contain uh, muscle contain oxygen to, for metabolism. But virtually every cell which is metabolizing energy has mitochondria and cytochrome P450, and so every cell uh, needs iron to work um, efficiently. Now the iron tests are uh, related to this uh, so every day, you're, uh, typically, in a good diet, you've got 10 or 20 milligrams of iron. You're only absorbing about 10% of that, mainly the heme iron. It's absorbed into the body and transported onto the transfer protein for iron called transferrin. Um, you also lose about uh, two, one or two milligrams of iron a day through the cells in your gut, which you lose every day. Now that iron is distributed into the body, particularly into red cells and muscle, and also into all of those other cells, but also into storage. And typically about 20 or 30% of your iron is in store storage. And that storage protein is ferritin. So the transfer protein of transferrin and the storage protein of ferritin are the main two things we're measuring in the blood. Now the international guideline actually states that you just need one test, ferritin, to work out what your iron levels are. And, and um, it should be used to diagnose iron deficiency. Now, in Australia, about, um, there's about 30,000 tests per 100,000 population. So on average, one in three Australians have an iron test, but, but really um, some people are having lots of iron tests. And usually it's the full profile, this full profile of iron studies, rather than just the ferritin level. So the schedule actually says that you can order ferritin or you can order the full iron panel. And most of the time, doctors will order the full iron panel. And that's what I'll be discussing today. So here is a 21-year-old lady with a full iron panel. She's got heavy periods, and so they're wondering about her iron status. Now, the thing that I want to draw your attention to is over on the right, the reference intervals, the cutoffs. How do we interpret what's normal? Well, the reference interval in green is what's seen in apparently healthy people. So that's focused on health. Whereas the numbers in red there, the saturation of 45 or the ferritin of 30, they're not what's usually seen in the population. They're determined clinically to say that's the point at which disease appears. So they're not reference intervals aimed at health. They're clinical decision limits aimed at disease. So there's a difference in those cutoffs, which we'll discuss during the talk. So the first test in that um, process was the serum iron. And most people, uh, especially lay people, think that's the test, your iron level. But that's the most useless test. It's the amount of iron on the transfer protein. So um, the amount of iron in your blood is less than 0.1% of all your blood in your body. So it's really not reflecting your body stores of iron at all. It's just telling us what's on the road rather than what's in that warehouse. And it's all bound to transferrin. Low levels of serum iron can just be due to the variation in the amount of iron in your blood during the day, after a meal, and typically it's lower in the afternoon. It's not, but your stores aren't changing that way. Um, high levels, similarly, can rise after an iron tablet or after a, a meat meal. So they're not really reliable at all. 
The second test is the transfer protein itself, the transferrin. So rather than measuring how many ions there, how many trucks are there? And so now transferrin contains two atoms of iron per molecule and it's made by the liver to transfer protein around the body. It's also known as the total iron binding capacity of blood because that's how much iron blood can carry. Now low levels of transferrin when would you not send out the trucks when the body's overloaded? It doesn't need any iron. So low levels of transferrin is a good marker of iron overload. But they're also low if you're having trouble with protein, if you're not making enough or if you're losing it from the body. And it's also changes if the body decides to make less trucks, like when you've got an infection or inflammation or when the liver's busy trying to um, cope with disease itself. High levels of transferrin, high levels of the trucks, are due to a demand for iron. The tissues are demanding iron, so we send out more trucks. So high levels of transferrin indicate iron deficiency, but in situations where you we need more iron transport, like in pregnancy, there's high levels of trucks. So the transferrin on its own is, again, not telling you about iron stores, it's just telling you about the demand and the protein production. <coughs> Now, I won't go into this into detail, but some reports have transferrin as total iron binding capacity. And you can work out how, if you know there's one gram of transferrin, you know that it can carry 25 micromoles of iron. So the third part of the full iron profile is the saturation. So in the trucks, how full are they? That's all it's saying. And typically the trucks are 10 to 45% full. So transferrin saturation is 10 to 45%. So um, now when might that be low? Well, since I'm varying during the day, it'll vary um, according to the afternoon it'll be lower, after meals will be higher. So it does vary during the day. But it also varies with um, uh, when you take iron and when you've got inflammation or hepatitis. The last test, which was the important one, is ferritin. So it's the storage protein that's leaking into the blood. Now, ferritin's a very interesting molecule. It's an isomer of 24 subunits. It forms a sphere, like, let's say a soccer ball, and inside is contained all the iron. It can contain, every molecule of transferrin can contain 4,500 atoms of iron. So it's a very efficient way to store that iron. But the ferritin that's in our blood doesn't have iron. It's just the apoferritin, the subunits of ferritin, which are leaking out as we're making ferritin in the cells. So the ferritin in our blood's got nothing to do with the <coughs> iron stores. It's, it's just a reflection of how much of the storage proteins we're making. So it is a reflection of the cellular um, storage of iron. <coughs> Okay, so now the best thing about ferritin is a low ferritin only means one thing, you're lacking iron. If you've got low levels of storage protein, you must lack <coughs> iron to store. But high levels can be seen in many situations, not only iron overload, but we also make more ferritin in situations of inflammation, cancer and hepatitis. So um, with this um, lady, we, we're looking at her results and um, she's got a ferritin level which is low, which can only mean one thing, she's iron depleted. Um, the other tests don't quite fit. She doesn't have low serum iron because she's trying to get it out to the tissue, but her transferrin level, the trucks, are busy. They're pushing out uh, trucks to try to get it to the tissue. Now the cutoff that we, I've used there is 30. And as I said before, that's a clinical decision limit. It's been set by the College of Pathologists in Australia. We've agreed that anything below 30 is deficient. But different labs use different things. And across Australia and across the world, you'll see cutoffs of 10 or 12 or 15 or 20 or 25. Now they ignoring the advice of the experts and, and really trying to reassure their users that there's not a problem. So in Australia, if you use the cutoff of, of uh, 30, 34% of premenopausal women are iron deficient. And that's alarming. And people say, well, that can't be true. 
Um, if you use the cutoff of 12, well then it seems like only 5 or 10 percent are iron depleted. Now I'll come. So how do we work out what the cutoff should be? Now this is the relationship between ferritin and the presence of anemia. And you can see when the ferritin is below 10, it's odds on you're going to be anemic. But as the ferritin is lowering below 30 to 20 to 10, the chance of anemia is rising. So it's not, it's not ideal to have ferritin levels in the 21 to 30 range. And men with ferritin levels of 21 to 30 will be, will be odds on to be anemic. And, and postmenopausal women, 25% of them will be anemic. So the cutoff of 10 or 12 may describe the population and when the alarm bells are sounding loudly, but we want to prevent anemia. And so we want to detect iron deficiency when anemia is starting to develop, not when it's fully established. That's why we use the cutoff of 30 in Australia. Now that woman, remembering that her ferritin level is 20, she wasn't anemic. And we want to keep her that way. So we want to get her, give her some good iron stores. Now one last warning regarding ferritin is this is, this is an Australian survey where we send uh, samples to every laboratory in Australia and the average value for ferritin in, is here's 25 but from laboratory to laboratory the result could be 20 or 30. So whilst, and, and we, we won't be able to improve that for the next five or 10 years. We don't have an international standard way to standardise it. So, so that's another reason why labs are unsure about what to use, but on average, they should be using 30. And unless you know your laboratory is measuring lower or higher, don't play with the numbers, use 30. Um, the thresholds vary from lab to lab, so here the, the, you know, the point at which ferritin starts to become anemia varies with old methods and new methods, and, and, and uh, so here the cutoff could be 20 or 30, depending on which method you were using. And in this recent paper, um, the cutoff can also vary, as I showed, with men and women. In children, the cutoff seems to be about 20 when the anemia starts to develop. So iron stores across life, um, the, first of all, the white circles, the pale circles, are, are men. And so once you stop growing, you start to accumulate iron stores. Whereas the dark circles are women, and they, they don't, once they stop growing, they still don't accumulate iron because they lose, most Australian women are losing iron every month with um, their period. So they never really develop an iron store. As soon as they hit menopause and stop menstruating, their iron stores pick up again. So it's, that's why premenopausal women in Australia, because um, they're having more periods than women have had in evolution, um, they're always bordering on iron deficient. So what predicts iron deficiency in in women, so those bars on the right, uh, on the, uh, on, yeah, on your right, um, are the clinical scenarios where we can predict there might be iron deficiency in women. And yes, yeah, certainly if they've got anemia or microcytosis, if they've got menorrhagia, that's the searching for rage, um, and, uh, and also veg. So if there's any history of vegetarian or veganism, twice as likely to be iron deficient. Um, interestingly, things like tiredness and so on don't really predict it because I suppose everyone's tired. <laughs> and in men, what predicts iron deficiency? Well, they don't get menorrhagia, but they do have uh, vegetarianism, and if they have um, vegetarian, they also twice as likely to become iron depleted. So um, this has been well understood that um, premenopausal women have a high risk of iron deficiency. And so in Australia, the risk of iron depletion is about 40% for girls between 16 and 25 and 30% after the age of 25. Um, and then it rises slightly with older age when diets and other diseases start causing problems. So, um, and people say, well, why are so many young women getting tested with iron studies? With good reason. 
That's why women get tested three times as more commonly as men. So um, here's a, a young girl. She's got a low serum iron and low saturation and a ferritin which is normal. Well, this is an afternoon sample. That's the only reason why her serum iron is low. She doesn't have iron deficiency. And so we, we've known for 70 or 80 years that irons are low in the late afternoon. Now, we don't give warnings to people, but when they ring up and say, I don't understand these results, we say, could you please test in the morning? And it's twice as likely to have a, fer a low iron or saturation in the morning. Now, uh, College of General Practice have some guidelines for preventive activity, and in children they say you should consider iron deficiency and vitamin D deficiency in all your patients, the risk, because it has long-lasting effects. People have shown that iron depletion is related to cog cognitive defects in children. And giving iron to young girls that have got low ferritin levels improves their memory and so on. Now, I'm not going that we could spend an hour on all of this. So, um, so here's a child, tiredness and vegetarian, they're at risk. They must have iron studies. The iron studies here, um, we'll go through them individually. The serum iron's two. Well, it was taken nearly five o'clock. Is that really, is it low? I don't know. So there's the distribution of serum iron in children. There's that one-year-old, the white dot, and you can see they're lower than most kids. Um, the transferrin level is a bit high. Maybe that's a sign. Well, you can see that it's often a little bit high in two- or three-year-olds. Um, the saturation's low. Well, if the serum iron's low, the saturation's going to be low, and that's, um, but maybe that's because it's an afternoon sample and the ferritin level is undetectable. And that is not normal. And just a warning, this is like shocking information. Um, so the haemoglobin level was like a quarter of what it should be. So no wonder the poor thing was tired. And, and the picture on the right is these cells with lacking haemoglobin, they're smaller than usual, they're elongated, they're, you know, it's a, it's a disaster. Um, here's another two-year-old with this pattern, which in some labs they might call that ferritin normal. And the patient is not anemic. I told you, if the ferritin's above 10, the chances are you won't be anemic. But you're on the way to anemia. And, um, and people have found, you know, in, in India, in places where there, there is a strong vegetarian, 69% of the children are anemic because of iron deficiency. And if they just give them a bit of iron, it improves their neurocognitive development. Okay, the other guideline in the College of General Practice is the pregnancy. Um, so we should consider uh, iron deficiency in pregnancy. So here's a, a woman who's 21 weeks pregnant. She's on a ketogenic diet, and it's probably why her, her ferritin's fine. But um, see that cutoff of 30? Again, it'll vary from lab to lab whether they call that deficient or not. Here's a woman who was um, six weeks pregnant, and her ferritin level's been borderline, 39 or 50, for a few years. Um, but now it's 29, and some labs will call that normal and some will say it's deficient. Like, and, and according to the Australian guideline, this should be called deficient. Now, she's not anemic at the moment, so it's easy for people to say everything's OK. It's just a borderline iron level. But this mother's going to start shipping iron into that baby. And in the third trimester, when she was tested, surprise, surprise, she's severely iron deficient and developed anemia. The warning was there in the first trimester. And we can see all women on average drop their ferritin across pregnancy, and the lowest point is in the third trimester. And we could have predicted from a ferritin of 29 that she would be undetectable in the third trimester if she didn't have treatment. So, and what importance does that have? Um, well, people have shown if you can maintain a normal ferritin level in women, 
their seven-year-old children will, ha will perform better academically and, and socio-economic uh, and socio-cognitively. Um, so these have long-lasting effects on children. In utero effects, probably have effects in children after life. So th these are really important issues, and um, I am struggling. Now we're moving on to a different topic here, which are bacteria. Bacteria love iron. They, they depend on it just as much as we do for, for energy and so on. And so they've got a very good way which, of when they're infecting us, they'll punch holes in our red cells. They're the hemolysins that lies your blood. And they'll produce iron glues, siderophores, things which will bind iron. So release it from the cells and then grab it and take it up. That's their number one uh, task when they invade the body to get access to your iron. So here's the bacteria, hemolysins, siderophores, out comes iron, which they need. Now, the body's defence is it recognises there's bacteria there. It'll produce cytokines and some local things, lactoferrin, which will bind a bit of that iron. But the cytokines will operate on the liver to produce this thing called inflammation, or the acute phase response, and it produces proteins, ceruloplasmin, which will bind the iron, well, oxidise the iron and help you bind it. It'll produce haemopexin, which will bind heme. It'll produce haptoglobin, which will bind haemoglobin. So in a way, as quickly as the bacteria can destroy your cells, you'll bind it and remove it from the blood. Um, it also produces something called hepcidin, which tells all the cells in the body, stop moving iron around. And it switches off the production of the trucks, the transferrin. So, so a major response of our re response to bacteria is to hide iron and stop it getting out and being available to bacteria. Now, because of that, because you're hoarding the iron and not letting it out anymore, guess what? Your stores increase. So ferritin behaves as if it was an acute phase reactant. It's not actually stimulated by the cytokines, it's just increasing because you're not moving iron. So in inflammation, the ferritin looks high only because you're hoarding it. So it's our number one defence. Um, so here's a, a young 11-year-old girl who she's got... Now she's got a ferritin level 124, it's pretty good for a child. But why has she got a low serum iron and a low level of transferrin, the trucks? There's something wrong here. And this is inflammation. She's seeing a gastroenterologist. Her CRP, which is a sensitive measure of inflammation, is very, very high for a child. And she has calprotectin. She's got Crohn's disease. She's got an inflammatory autoimmune disease of the bowel. That ferritin level is misleading. The ferritin level's high because she's hoarding iron as a response to this inflammation. Um, she hasn't got anemia yet. Now, this is another thing important to interpreting results. So her hemoglobin is 115. Oh, she's not anemic. These are not black and white results. She's on the threshold of anemia. Are you going to ignore it and say, it's no, there's not a problem? These are not black and white. There's a continuum here. She's, she is um, really on the threshold of anemia. Here's a 20-year-old uh, girl. Similar pattern. The ferritin looks OK. But what's going on with the low serum iron and low transferrin? Does she have inflammation? Is she hiding away iron and not sending out trucks? And she had glandular fever. So you can't trust that ferritin. So what level of ferritin can we trust if there's inflammation present? Unfortunately, the international guideline tells us. It says 70. The cutoff is now 70. If you've got inflammation and your ferritin's above 70, you've probably got enough iron. But if you've got inflammation and your ferritin's 55, like the girl with glandular fever, you're probably iron deficient. And the only reason the ferritin looks OK is because of the inflammation. Um, this is a, uh, an old, older man who's got anemia. I'm trying to remember the case. <laughs> he's probably another inflammation. Yeah, so he's got inflammation there. You can see those results. Low serum iron, the two. Low transferrin, low iron. And his ferritin level's 58. But it's in the presence of a, 
CRP of 61. We would say he's probably iron deficient because it should be above 70 in the presence of inflammation. And guess what? When they fixed his inflammation and you know, the iron started moving around, he didn't have enough. He's iron deficient. And that's why he had the anemia. Now, moving on to the last topic is hemochromatosis. So it's, it's important to think of. Um, so the College of uh, General Practice says you must consider hemochromatosis testing, particularly if there's hepatitis, family history, or, or premature joint disease. So it's a defect in the HFE gene, it's low, and it results in hoarding of iron. You, your, liver, your bowel just keeps absorbing iron even though you've got enough. Um, about one in ten Australians have carry the gene for hemochromatosis. It's a, m probably the most common disease gene in the Australian population. Um, in Ireland, where it's thought to arise, one in six carry the gene. Now, chance of marrying somebody else with a gene, one in seven times one in seven is one in 50, and one in four of their kids will have two doses of the gene. And that means the prevalence of hemochromatosis in Australia is about one in 200, the full-blown hemochromatosis. But the disease seems to have a penetrance. Only half the people are affected by liver disease and so on. So it's one in 400 Australians only, one in 400 Australians affected by this disease. That's hundreds of thousands. Um, and what does it do? If you hoard iron, you tend to hoard it in the liver and the liver falls apart. You get hepatitis, cirrhosis and cancer. Um, it also gets into the vascular system and causes heart problems. It gets into the joints, iron, rust. <laughs> it gets into the joints and causes premature arthritis and it gets into hormonal producing cells like the pancreas and the pituitary and cause the problems as well. So it's well worth preventing. And the government recognises this and says any Australian who wants this test can have it, um, as long as they satisfy these criteria. So either you've got abnormal iron studies suggesting you're iron overloaded, or you've got a first degree relative who's been proven to have hemochromatosis, um, he, or a relative that's had the gene test, even though they don't seem to have the disease, they've got the gene. So, so really, if you've got liver disease, arthropathy or chronic fatigue, you should do the iron studies. If they're abnormal, do the gene test. But if you've got a family history, straight to the gene test. Um, so here's a, a pregnant woman, five weeks pregnant, and she had some iron studies. And it's like, whoa, congratulations, you've got a really good ferritin level, better than most women, and you've got a high saturation. Are you taking tablets? No. Why, why have you got a high saturation, high ferritin level as a young woman who's pregnant? Maybe you've got. And this is a confirmed abnormality, a confirmed abnormality of ferritin or of saturation. She needs to have the gene test. And she had the gene test, and she's homozygote. Now, because her partner is uh, heterozygote, half their children are going to be have hemochromatosis. Now, it's not a reason for prenatal counsel or anything, but it's good to know. Um, now, why wasn't her ferritin high? Her ferritin wasn't high, abnormally high, because she's menstruating. She was menstruating before she got pregnant. And that means she tries to hoard it, but she loses it every month. Um, whereas men have really high uh, ferritins. So typically in men, the first thing that rises is iron and saturation. And then by the, eight, by the time they're about age 30, the ferritin's high. And then by the time they're age 40, their liver's falling apart. With women, they're protected till menopause. So with hemochromatosis, they're... Iron levels might be high, as it was in this woman, pre-menopause, uh, pre but their ferritin level isn't high. It only starts to rise at menopause, and the liver disease starts to occur at age 60 or 70. So, so that's the pattern. Women sort of get everything 30 years after the men. But the clues are there at the beginning. So here's the classical 
Here's a 48-year-old man. He's got a ferritin level of 2,600, saturation of 84%. He probably doesn't even need a genetic test. Um, and, and by the time your ALT, your ferritin levels are over 1,000, I guarantee you'll have liver disease. And, he's, um, and he, he did have... Uh, well, here's his, uh, liver, here's his liver function test. His ALT is 75. Um, and he had the gene test done. Um, this is a 68-year-old woman who in 2007 labelled with excess alcohol. That's what the cause of the liver disease is. She improved her alcohol a bit. The gamma GT fell down, but the ALT stayed high. Um, four years later, she saw a gastroenterologist and said, you know, he probably thought, there's something else. There's something else going on here. And, um, and um, that was her iron studies, which are sort of game, set and match um, hemochromatosis, and she had the gene test, and it was right. So hemochromatosis often takes five or ten years to um, finish. Now, it's easy to treat. You just take blood off. You may have to take a unit, go, do 20 or 50 donations to get all that iron off, but that helps the community with all those blood donations because they're used, and, um, and it's easy to treat. Um, there hasn't been much on LCHF, but I can tell you that carnivore diets do not cause hemochromatosis. The body regulates its iron stores. If you eat a lot of iron, you cannot overregulate. It's only when you've got hemochromatosis that you will hoard the iron when, with no, for no reason. And, and probably, if you've got a high ferritin level on a carnivore diet, you probably should, should be giving lots of blood. <laughs> okay, so in summary, ferritin is the best test for iron deficiency. Less than 10 means you're anemic. It's a disaster. Um, less than 30 means you're on the way to anemia and you've got all those problems with cognition. You should be doing something. If you've got inflammation, less than 70 is a warning. Hemochromatosis is very common, so you should have a high level of suspicion if there's a family history, if there's hepatitis, which is unexplained, um, or if there's premature joint disease. And, and in that situation, you should screen with iron studies and then confirm with HFE testing. So, thank you.